Congratulations, Norman, and thank you so much for being here. And thanks to the festival for bringing you to our stage uh, and for your, your honesty and forthrightness in this film. Thank you. I love being here. Great. One thing I've learned about the microphones here at the Castro, and I get to direct Norman Lear for one tenth of a second. You need to speak totally like right into right them. Right into them. Yes. Um, so I had the pleasure of sitting behind you just now for the last 91 minutes. Um, I stayed awake, didn't I? You did? <laughs> <laughs> so naturally, my, my first question really is, what is it like to watch a version of you in the form of this documentary, Unspool Before You. Does it feel like it hits who you feel yourself to be in this moment? You know, it, all my life, I have been an audience member. I think it's true off camera, on camera, in, you know, in the theater, in a movie. Uh, I have no attitude but to sit down to whatever I'm watching and say, take me, take me, I'm yours. <laughs> and uh, this is the fourth time. First time doesn't count because my family was all around. All I thought of was what they were thinking, how they were feeling and so forth. So this is the third time I've seen it. And, uh, and I sat down <laughs> the same way. I think Heidi Ewing and Rachel Grady I, I can't get over what a fabulous job they did. So again, I sat there and I said, take me. <laughs> and thank you. Thank you for them. I'm so, I, Brent explained earlier that Heidi was supposed to be here and ha fell off a bicycle and hurt herself. Well, but I just marvel at the creativity in the making of that film. They did a wonderful job. Agreed. And, I, and I'm wondering whether... First of all, how it was that you decided to put yourself kind of up on the dissection table um, and what, if there were any ground rules that you talked about? Were you surprised at how, how deep this the went? The only ground rule was uh, I had nothing to say. I lived the life. They were going to do what they did. That was the understanding with American masters. That's the way they, that's their rule. And uh, because I knew their work... I mean, indeed, we, we met and we talked and so forth, but I knew what they'd done preceding this, and uh, I was a great fan. So I relaxed. I, I, I wasn't concerned about it. Um, I'm really touched by the candor that you brought to, uh, to, the, to the interviews. I assume they were, there were several or, or many. Um, and also by the abiding power of the, your relationship with your father that you write about beautifully in the book, but which clearly is an ongoing process of discovery for you. Um, can you. Can you talk a little bit about whether this was a relationship that you decided at some point to... A relationship, I beg your pardon? With your father. Was there a point at which in, in your 80s or... I wish to just say recently that you decided to kind of revisit this to understand something more about yourself? Well, I, I think, you know, there are two journeys in life. There's the horizontal journey in which we're learning about everything, you know, all the subjects we learn more and more and more about. And then there's the vertical journey into ourselves, which I think is the longest uh, and, and perhaps the most fruitful. And that's the journey in which, uh, you know, I thought a great deal about my father, uh, my relationship to him, what it meant to me as I grew older. Uh, I, there, the, the phrase, count on me, for example, I picked up really as a kid. I was, I don't know, it was before I was married the first time. And I loved the expression, count on me. And I think I loved it because I couldn't count on my dad. And uh, I wanted to be counted on. 
and uh, I'm on a, a, a long path to answer a question I've already forgotten. <laughs> but, <laughs> <laughs> we're gonna cut, we're gonna cut you now all that's kinds of 93. <laughs> 93 and i have to say four days shy of 94 your birthday is coming up on wednesday um so uh, yes 94 <laughs> you did actually answer the question don't um don't don't uh, cut yourself um but no, nobody asked the, me much about my mother she was there, too. <laughs> right. Well, in fact, and that comes up in the film where you actually had to say to her, where were you? And her answer was, oh, please. You so, know, there, was, there was a brief clip in the film. I haven't, I, I don't think I've talked about this. There was a brief clip in the film and of my mother when I walked in with our grandson, you, with our son, her grandson after he was, I don't know, three, four months old, and she came out to California to see her grandson. And uh, I'm going to imitate her, because I brought the baby in to her, and she went... <laughs> and the fact is that that, of course, went on longer, maybe a minute. She never touched him. She couldn't touch him. And from the first time I saw that, that has wrapped itself around my brain. That was our relationship. She, she talked about me as if I was 12 years old. She never f actually faced me as a grown young man or middle-aged guy. <laughs> she never addressed my success or my writing or my... Uh, I was that kid who used to fall down the stairs to get laughs. And the business of her inability to touch her grandson spoke, you know, chapters to me. Who said that? <laughs> my mother, the mother joke is a lifetime. Uh, but it's, illustra it's illustrated uh, best by a phone call I received on a Sunday morning some many years ago uh, from the fellow who was running the, uh, John Mitchell was his name, he was the first president of the Television Academy of Arts and Sciences. And he called me on a Sunday morning to say they had a meeting all day yesterday and they've decided to establish a Hall of Fame. The Television, American Academy of Television Hall of Fame. And the first inductees, he said, they had agreed on would be Edward R. Murrow, the greatest of the foreign correspondents, Bill Paley, who started CBS, David, General David Sarnoff, who started NBC, uh, uh, Patty Chayefsky, I think the greatest writer that ever got, Lucille Ball, Milton Berle, and you, Norman. I called my mother immediately, <laughs> Bridgeport, Connecticut. Mother, Television Academy is starting a Hall of Fame. These are the first in like tees, and I live, and me. And she said, listen, if that's what they want to do, who am I to say? <laughs> Yeah, because you like her so well. Years later, <laughs> I was bringing her to California. It could have been that. No, it wasn't that trip with the baby. It was later. She, I was bringing her to California. I sent a car to pick her up in Bridgeport, brought her to American Airlines, met her with a wheelchair at, uh, uh, at the uh, curb, pushed her myself all the way up to the... Uh, on the way up, she was fiddling in her pocketbook and she wanted to show me some, she had a new eye doctor and she wanted to show me these uh, uh, bottle of eye drops. She just loved this doctor. She loved talking about her doctors. And this doctor was just wonderful in these eye drops and so forth. We get up on the plane. I'm sitting uh, at the uh, bulkhead so that she can have more easier access. Uh, and
And we're in the air 20, 25 minutes, and a strange guy is walking down the aisle, and my mother pulls him by the sleeve. She says, sir, he stops, she fiddles, and she says, my eye doctor gave me these drops. I have to take two drops in this eye. Would you be so good? <laughs> and he said, of course, ma'am. And I'm sitting there. I think I'm 63 years old. And my mother is, this strange man is putting two drops in her eye. And he leaves. I don't know if my mother ever knew what a double take was. But she looked at me as I'm looking at her. <laughs> Watch, she said. I said, mother, why did you ask a strange, I'm sitting here, your son. You asked a strange man to put the drops in your eyes. She said, well, you have to be very careful. <laughs> I said, you think I couldn't be careful? She said, well, and patient. I said, mother. She said, some patience. <laughs> couldn't win. I think, um, I think we now know a bit of the source of your own <laughs> humor. Um, between, between her love for talking about her doctors and her um, being, it seems quite difficult to impress with your own accomplishments, um, your mom's a Jewish mother. Um, <laughs> How did you know? <laughs> <laughs> so, but one thing that the film doesn't quite go into, and since this is, uh, you're getting the Freedom of Expression Award from the San Francisco Jewish Film Festival, I am, uh, I, I'm curious about the degree to which Jewish life or thinking or values were present in, in, in your family, to, what, to the degree they formed you beyond the horror of hearing Father Coughlin. Uh, no, the Jewish values were pretty much cultural. I was bar mitzvahed. Um, and, <laughs> as a, oh, Somebody's going to heckle and ask you to taught, recite your portion. <laughs> you know, about, about 10, 12, maybe 14 months ago, uh, I have a meeting to which, a board meeting of something, to which people are coming in from out of town. A fellow flies in from New York, and he says to me, I was sitting with a woman uh, and told her why I was coming out to New York and that I'm, I would be seeing you. And she said, Norman Lear, oh, for crying out loud, she said, I have two books I would never do away with. What? She said, it's it, two books my mother gave me. My mother passed away some years ago. She was in the middle of the country someplace, I think it was Ohio, and she picked up a book in a uh, synagogue they were raising some money. She said, it's the Bible that the, uh, that the synagogue gave Norman Lear at his bar mitzvah. <laughs> I said, please tell me you took her number or address. She said, yes. She gave me the number. I called this woman. I said, I understand from this friend that you have a Bible. That's my Bible from my bar mitzvah. She said, uh, she said yes. I said, can I, she said, I want to, I, I've saved it, Hope, I never dreamed I'd be able to give it to Norman Lee. I said, well, can I come and get it? She said, how do I know you're Norman Lee? <laughs> <laughs> she said, is there anything in the book? Well, tell, me, tell me where you were by misfit. I said, the Shari Zedek Synagogue on Kingston Avenue in Brooklyn. She said, come get the book. <laughs> I have my Bible from my Bible. <laughs> I don't know what it means that, that that gift was found in a rummage sale. I'm not sure quite, <laughs> quite what that means. Um, but I guess so, so many of us who are so admiring of your work in social justice, um, not just your writing in entertainment, but then the turn that you took to found people for the American way, have a kind of... Um, whether it's unconscious or, or maybe willed sense, that this is somehow an expression of Jewish values. I don't, and I don't want to project that onto you. So I'm wondering if you might articulate the degree to which, or not, Jewishness fueled a sense of righteousness in social and political causes for you. Well, I think it does. And I don't know enough about all religions, to, but I would have to assume that... Uh, that at the basis of all religions, 
before the uh, the human of the species got involved. <laughs> How the hell do you say this? Uh, of course, Jewish values, as I understand Jewish values, and culturally, I could not feel or believe myself to be more Jewish. As far as the religion aspect of it, the and this I mean for all religions. Uh, I'm, I'm, it's, a, it's a subject I spend a great deal of time thinking about. Uh, I don't believe there's an atheist I've ever met. Now, I have a lot of friends who tell me they're atheists. But so, I believe, so long as you believe, there is an answer. Uh, whatever that answer is, how it came about, what follows, what we know here, uh, then you're a believer. I, I believe that with all my heart. You're a believer. You don't have to believe in anything else. If you happen to buy into a religion, any of them, then you bought into that, and uh, certainly as an American, I applaud that. You have a right to everything you feel and think. Just don't trouble me with it, because <laughs> I have a right to believe and feel as I think. And, you know, I, so I believe that the specific individual religion, well, let me put it this way. I don't know how many, how many people does this theater hold? 1,407. 1,400. Let's assume there are 1,400 people here. My deepest belief is that each of your compacts with the almighty God, Jesus, whatever uh, one cares to call him, there are 1,400 individual compacts here, no two alike, like no two... Uh, you know, uh, snowflakes, no two alike. It, the, that compact is individual. I, I propose we keep it there and in our families where we agree on the same way of expressing it and in our congregations and not in the public square. If there's, <laughs> if there's anything the human or the species has, uh, has taught us, life as human beings has taught us, is that uh, that's a dangerous place to go. We don't belong there. It all belongs here. Well, in, in your work in starting in the, in the 80s, um, when there was this thing called the moral majority, you put your cards on the table and said there's a different kind of America that you understood. Um, so it, it's inevitable in this very charged and complicated political moment. Here we are, whatever, 72 hours after the end of um, the Republican National Convention and on the eve of the DNC. Um, I, you said even, you know, in the film, you're, nine, you're 90 and some, some, some people just presume that you're wise, but you, you definitely are experienced in this, in this arena. So I'm wondering if you have words of wisdom as to how to understand the political moment we're in. Uh, I don't begin to understand. <laughs> uh, Does it feel... I have, I have thought of uh, Donald Trump as the middle finger of the American right hand. <laughs> oh boy, is this a city to express that. <laughs> And what I specifically mean by that is, uh, you know, the man is, uh, the man is the fool he is, he's the asshole he is, he's whatever the hell you want to call him. But, I, and I believe the American people understand that, basically. And they're saying, this is the kind of leadership you give us whether we're talking about the pharmaceutical companies or the automobile companies or, uh, you know, everything Ike Eisenhower warned us about when he warned us about the military industrial and in his first draft he called it the military industrial congressional complex. 
They're saying, this is the kind of leadership you give us everywhere, take that. And that is Donald Trump. Um, the, there, was, there was a time, I kind of want to bring this, this um, the political um, righteous indignation into the question of what television and the media we consume might have to say about that or when you started making your socially engaged uh, sitcoms, we kind of had a chance as a nation to have one conversation. I mean, I was ex amazed to, to, to hear the numbers of how many millions of viewers turned in, tuned in to the two-part abortion uh, episodes of Maud. And I'm wondering if the landscape has changed utterly to an unrecognizable state with regard to media. And well, I think starting way back then and uh, escalating uh, all through, through all these years has been, you know, maybe our greatest product in America is excess. Excess of every kind. And, uh, you know, when, when there were three networks before there were even four, uh, those people were called broadcasters. They're not, you know, there isn't a network that isn't owned by something vastly larger. And, uh, and you know, we are a country that, uh, a, a, a system of government that depends, uh, they said from the beginning, on an informed citizenry. But when there were conversations going, we were a better informed citizenry. I think what passes for conversation is bumper stickers yelling. I mean, these faces we all see too often, just bumper sticking, uh, dis disagreeing, yelling at each other. That's not information and it's not leadership. And I don't know where we really have, or the American people earn and do not have the leadership they require to be an informed. But it, it, my my head is jammed with all the inequity I see uh, for people just struggling to get through. You know, I'm I'm, I'm involved in a show called America Divided that'll be on in October or November or something. I just did one episode as a kind of a journalistic host, Common, America Farrar, uh, uh, a few others and I are each hosting one. And the subject I am hosting has to do with uh, housing in New York. And anybody making a reasonable living, a doctor or a lawyer, with not a major practice, but a reasonable practice, can no longer afford to live in New York City. That's what, you know, I, I don't know how many people around the country know that. No, but, but, but people in, in the city limits of San Francisco know it very well. <laughs> we are de dealing with a, a similar uh -huh. massive uh, inequity or, or gap. Um, but I'm curious whether, I mean, you obviously, you're working on projects constantly. You, cert you have, I guess, some uh, faith that whether it's, news or commentary or entertainment or comedy can still be relevant and speak to some of these issues. Do, do, you, do you see that in the current, let's even restrict it well, to the comedy I, I, landscape? Well, you know, South Park has never stopped commenting. Right. And uh, occasionally when I turn into it, it's as great as it was, what, 17 years ago when it started. Uh, and... Uh, and you've you've, uh, ment you've mentored those those guys. Oh, right? we're good. Yeah, no, we're good friends. I think Carmichael is uh, the new Carmichael show is is doing that, and uh, uh, Blackish. I mean, there are some great television shows that are struggling to get all these things, uh, right. all and these topics touched. But but I can tell from the reaction in the audience, it's hard to know. There is so much out there, and uh, I'm. Three times a week, somebody I respect is saying to me, you mean you're not watching XYZ? Right. I try to watch it, and 
I'm asked two days later if I'm not watching another one. And they're all wonderful. You mentioned two shows, Carmichael, which kind of dared to take on the subject of Bill Cosby and Blackish, yes. which, which, which had that amazing episode in which the uh, African American family had to have the talk about their fears about when Obama took office, about uh -huh. um, being, him being assassinated. Um, these were shows that were kind of pushing the edge and bringing up very uncomfortable conversations and topics in much the same way that you kind of laid the template for that um, with the shows that you did in the 70s. Um, do you think it's gotten easier for um, shows to push the envelope? Is there, is there stuff out there that you're still waiting for someone to address in a comic well, form? Those shows are doing it. I think they're perfectly terrific. Uh, what I'm hearing from others who are struggling to, not on the networks, you can do it on the uh, stream, the stations that stream. I'm doing a new show now. Tell us about it. I'm doing a, uh, a Latino version of One Day at a Time. You guys remember One Day at a Time? Of course. Well, this is a Cuban-American family. Uh, Rita Moreno is the older, the grandmother. Uh, Justina Machado is the... Uh, is the, the mother and uh, two great kids, this time a girl and a boy. And it's, I, I think they're doing a wonderful job. So at this point, in, in, let's just take that show as an example. Um, uh, what's your day-to-day -day or week-to-week -week or month-to-month -month role? Are you reviewing scripts? Are you involved in casting? How active are you? I'm reading scripts. I'm uh, in the meetings. I'm uh, at certainly all of the the uh, run-throughs and the readings and so forth. I'm not as involved as the people we call showrunners. Uh, they have most of the responsibility, but I'm overseeing and, you know, we're getting it pretty much the way I like it. Well, they're lucky to have you um, pushing, pushing the envelope. I know we want to leave some time for our audience uh, to participate. Um, there, may be, they, there may well be um, folks who want to ask you about specific shows or comments. So I think we have some uh, volunteers um, getting ready to take your questions. And if we could have them be questions, please. Right over here to your right in the front row in the center. Right over here, Mr. Nor Mr. Lear. All right. That doesn't matter. Go ahead. Look, right. I hear you. Yeah. Whoever, there you go. This may be a little be de a little depressing, but it wasn't truly explained what happened to your first wife. Did she just leave you, or uh, it wasn't explained very well in the movie? Well, why don't I write you a letter? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> what is it you want to know? Ask me anything. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I just feel it's, it's a shame. Well, actually, what, what, what I have been married three times. Oh. So the first wife isn't even in the film. They just couldn't get it all in. But I was married. Here's how I was married the first time. I was uh, uh, training to be a pilot. I, I went overseas. I flew 52 missions as a radio operator and a gunner. But I was studying that, at that moment in Buffalo, New York, to be a pilot. My best friend was uh, uh, Jimmy O'Leary. Yeah, my best friend was Jimmy Gorman. He introduced me to girl Helen O'Leary. The four of us were out to dinner. He and his girlfriend, we were at the top of the, butler, uh, the Sattler Hotel at a bar called the Circus Bar. The joke of the evening was if Helen O'Leary and I got married, she'd be Helen O'Leary Lear. <laughs> we were drinking Cuba Libras. I remember all of this so clearly. The bar was just going around very slowly. I got up inexplicably, walked to a, uh, a, cell, a, uh, a, a phone. Uh, pay phone. A yeah. pay phone, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> and called uh, West Hartford, Connecticut. And the person at the other end uh, said, hello. I said, Charlotte, I happened to pick up the phone. She said, Norman. We hadn't talked for a year and a half. We only went out for a little while. I see my Helen O'Leary and my friend Jimmy coming around the thing, and I hear myself ask, ask her, I'm in Buffalo, New York. Would you like to get married? She said, yes. 
two weeks later, she and her mother, my mother and father, were in uh, Buffalo, and we got married at the top of the Statler Hotel. So that's you, how you that was my first marriage. Story. Twelve and the, years, and, and she's the mother and of your oldest child, a glorious daughter, right, who makes a wonderful appearance in the in the film as well. Let's get another question. We have a question here, up to your left, in the back. I'm sorry, the lights are such yeah, that I can't... they're tough. But yeah, if you could stand, maybe we could see you. But yes, you're way at the back. Yes. Yeah, that's a real, uh, real pleasure to talk to you. I just wondered how uh, you got uh, Sammy Davis Jr. involved in uh, the famous episode and All in the Family, and I know he was later, later appeared in an episode of The uh, Jeffersons. Just wondering how you got uh, Sammy Davis Jr. involved in that uh, episode uh, Sam- of All in the Family. Sam- Sammy Davis... Uh, I met Sammy Davis when I worked years before with uh, Dean and Jerry. And he was part of uh, a group that got together all the time at a playhouse in the back of Jerry Lewis's uh, Garon Playhouse, named after his sons. And uh, when All in the Family went on, we were good friends, Sammy and I. And shortly after it went on, he begged to be on. He wanted to be on. And he was, I told him, I didn't even know that was the conceit. I didn't know where the bunkers were. They were in Queens someplace. If you find them, maybe they'll, I tried to keep it as real as that. And uh, he just went on and on. He wouldn't give up. And so we had Archie uh, start to drive a cab a couple of weeks before we were going to do the show with him so that the audience would know he drove a cab at night. Oh, so so the the cab driving was actually a, a multi episode setup yes. for the Sammy yeah. Davis episode. It was set up originally wow. for, for okay. so that Sammy Davis could be a, in his car, leave a briefcase, and have to come to the driver's house to pick up the briefcase. That's how we got on the show as Sammy Davis, not uh, as a you know as a guest star in a, as a character. Right. Um, I, I just and by the way, and the kiss was his idea. <laughs> Great. Can I just interject one question, sort of a follow-up to some of the issues that are brought up in the film about the the pain that the uh, that you were very sympathetic to uh, that Esther Roll and John Amos uh, experienced in Good Times, as sort of having to carry the burden of representation as the first kind of intact yeah. b- black family on TV. Did you did you get it when you started writing the series that it, that even for you as a writer or your team of writers, that you were going to have that burden of representation? Was that also hard on you? No, it was very hard. I didn't, uh, I didn't anticipate it, but I understood it, you know, early on in readings uh, that uh, there was a big burden on them representing the, uh, you know, the African-American experience and especially parents of a, of a black family when there had been none. So they were particularly sensitive to, you know, a lot of things that as a writer uh, who thought he understood families, black or white or, uh, you know, any kind of family. Uh, so it was a question of uh, allowing them to express what they wanted to express and listening to them very carefully and going along with uh, questions that were raised that where they seemed bright, but then when an entire script they wouldn 't do an entire script because the subject matter was sensitive, and it, indeed it was such the such film as... of the the young woman uh, I wanted to do an episode she was you know boys were hitting on her, she was turning sixteen or seventeen, and uh, I wanted to deal with the subject and easy to understand why Esther was afraid to go there. And that, that's when I had to sit down and say to the full cast, you know, you will take care of the patina. I didn't live, I didn't grow up as a black man in America. You take care of that. And uh, when it comes to disagreements about, you know, fathers and daughters and mothers and sons and so forth, if we have a disagreement, the buck has to stop somewhere, and it's going to stop with me. But she did, she did leave the show for a couple of years, right? Was it about... No, no, we, we killed him. Right. Yeah. He, he, he died. Yeah, but she never left no, the show. No, 
didn't didn't she drop out of a couple of seasons? Uh, no, 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 no. The oh, show sorry, went I'm misinformed. All the way, as long as it went, it went with her. Great. Okay. But we had to. Uh, the only way we could, you know, satisfy John was to kill him. <laughs> Next question. And by the way, he never said to a writer, "I'll hurt you." If you, you know, or we're, he never, ever said anything like that. This and next, I don't know what possessed him in this, but know, the but to the indicate that he would be violent. But the Panther story about them coming into oh, your office, yes, that was that, true. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Sorry. This next question comes from the center about four rows back. Hi. Uh, good evening, Mr. Leo. So uh, I was born in Brooklyn in 1961, grew up in Queens, and um, watched it all in the family as a very young teenager. And I remember a particular episode where there was a riddle that had to do with a father and son in a car crash, and the father is killed, and the son is wheeled into the hospital, and the surgeon says, I can't operate on him, he's my son. And there was a big uh, furor over that because no one could answer the riddle. I hope you recall what I'm talking about. Um, the, obviously, the answer was the surgeon was the mother. But almost the whole country couldn't answer that question, and it, it stuck with me for a long time. I wonder, is there a similar riddle today that no one could answer that would give that same kind of gender or um, religious or affiliation that none of us could answer that you can think of? Or if not, if there's something else about that you might want to comment on. Thank you. I think you're back on wait, wait, don't tell me, actually. <laughs> you think what? I think you're back on wait, wait, don't tell me. <laughs> you know, I remember the show as if I saw it the way you saw it. I don't remember the show, uh, the episode, intimately. So I cannot... I, I love being reminded of it, and I'm going to, I can answer it next week. Because <laughs> I'm going to find the episode and look at it. But I'm sorry, I don't... No, know. that's fair enough. But I guess part of, because the question is, is, is in a way about um, breaking gender stereotypes. Um, what was underneath part of that question was, um, do you still see uh, room for um, more... Uh, better or more uh, kind of accurate representation, whether it's in the LGBT or women's roles, and is that something that you actively push for in the scripts that you're doing? Or who's not getting represented right now in media that you want to rectify? What, come, what comes to mind is, uh, uh, I, I don't know that I see enough television to answer the question in the present, but. What comes to mind is a show I did called All That Glitters. Does anybody remember All That Glitters? Like Mary Hartman, it was a soap opera. It was on five times a week. But I was reminded in, in one of these uh, conversations with an audience of the show and the question of uh, transsexual, you know, when was the earliest? Of, and I think it might have been in All That Glitters, and I looked at... I, I remembered it, but I didn't remember it as well as I did after I looked at a few episodes recently. And uh, it was a, all that glitters. We turned Genesis around, and uh, Adam was conceived from the rib of Eve. The women were in played all the men's roles. They dressed as women. They were not in the least. Uh, lacking in their femininity. But they ran the companies, the men were home, the men took care of the children, the men did the cooking, the men, etc. cetera. And, uh, and we had four great actresses and their husbands. And we started the, in each of the homes to see how they were living. And then the women came to work. Now, here's where we started too fast, but it was just great. The, uh, where the women came to work was a marketing company, a promotion company, and they were promoting the equivalent, I can't remember the exact name, of the Marlboro woman. <laughs> and uh, Linda Gray, who later became a giant star on Dallas and easily one of the most beautiful women 
in television history, played the transsexual. She was the best looking guy you ever saw. <laughs> And I looked at that, and I was, I was stunned with it. Uh, it sounds like that's well worth finding on the, um, wherever we can find we, it. I think yeah. we're, when, you, when you look at that issue, and you see how far we've come in the last 15, 20 years, it's breathtaking. And it teaches us it can happen. And it ought to be happening a lot quicker with uh, racial issues. We have your, your next question to your left, up the aisle. Uh, hello. Uh, I wonder whether you, you in, in the movie you talk a little bit about how you started writing. I wonder whether you could say something about two things. One is how you got your sense of comedy. Where did it come from? And two, how do you think it changed over the many, many years that you have been in the field with all the changes in social and cultural life and political life that we have gone through? Well, when your father goes to jail at nine years of age and your mother and your sister disappear, or your mother and your sister for the moment, your mother isn't gonna live there anymore and she's selling the furniture and a guy is buying your father's red leather chair from which you used to listen to the radio with him, the Friday night fights and the, and the, the football games and the only great moments you ever had with him. And the guy who's buying the chair puts his hands on your shoulder and says, that, and, and, and says well, Norman, you're the man of the house now. If you don't understand the foolishness of the human conditions <laughs> at that moment, he's telling me that all this is going on, I'm the man of the house. And a moment later he's saying, there, there, the man of the house doesn't cry. So I think that's where I learned and I had the capacity to understand this was as foolish as <laughs> finding, and I knew that from that moment on, that there was, a, there was humor to be found in every situation, however tragic. I just, again, want to thank you for that. The particular way that I'm thinking specifically of your amazing run of shows in the 70s, the particular way that the comedy was arrived at, though, seems really um, innovative and specific to, to your sensibility. One of the main aspects, I think, is just the way you shot them. I mean, these were multi-camera with a live audience, which is, was yeah. not at all at that point typical. I mean, I think it was only maybe the, Lu the Lucille Ball show and maybe Dick Van Dyke and a couple of others that were performed in front of a live audience. What was it about that form of kind of theatrical live humor that you found especially useful? Well, that's kind of where my life began, you know, going to the theater. I love live performance. And I couldn't consider doing it another way. We did a show at five o'clock for one audience and, and then the same show repeated at eight o'clock for an entirely different audience. Now it's a little different today in the show I'm doing now. We've made seven. We're shooting the eighth episode Tuesday night. Please come. <laughs> uh, but we, we're, the way it's done now, it's Netflix, they order 13 episodes. So ostensibly, the night they go on, somebody could sit and watch eight hours, you'd be able to watch the entire uh, season. That makes it very different. And the way it's shot now, we, shot, we shoot before an audience that sits there from 5.30 to nine or 10 o'clock when it's finished. We did two episodes, I mean, the same episode twice. With the same audience? With the same, with, no, with two different audiences. An audience at five, well, it, an audience at eight. I, I understood, and, but you, at, back in the day, uh, you refused to use a laugh track, or at least that's my understanding, is that you were using the actual audience 
Oh, um, yeah, no, yeah. if the audience didn't laugh, that was it. We didn't have a laugh track. We had some, we had a, the equivalent of a laugh track when we made cuts, if we decided, if we lost something as a result of a cut between the afternoon show and the evening show, you know, we, we serviced it. But it was all live audience. Your next question is in your back or to your right. Hi, I was wondering if you could talk more about your founding of People for the American Way and what they're doing now and to what extent you're involved in the projects they have now. Well, to answer the last part of that question first, I, I don't wake up that many mornings, read the newspaper, which I do. I cannot get the news from a cell phone or the computer. I, I love the pages of a newspaper. And here, here. I, so I will, I, I sit for a couple of hours with the uh, Los Angeles Times, the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal. I read feverishly. <laughs> uh, I don't read my papers many mornings when I don't thank God people for the American Way and other organizations are there because they are so needed. In this crazy political moment, People for the American Way is working, first of all, to get voters. We have, there's, there are young people for the American Way and young elected, YEO, young elected officials, something like 2,000 across the country that are now serving in uh, elected offices. And, uh, you know, a huge uh, movement to get the Latino vote. So that's the effort, get, getting the voters out. Here, here. Um, this will be the last question for the day. It's up here to your left. You answered my question. I was going to ask another question. The episode of All in the Family that I remember best was perhaps one of the more moving shows, and this audience, I think, would appreciate it. A friend of Archie Bunker died, and he was invited to the funeral to speak about his friend. And until he got to the funeral, it never occurred to him that this friend could be Jewish. And there was Archie Bunker wearing a yarmulke, delivering a very moving eulogy. Can you talk a little bit about that and how you wrote that? You know, how I wish we could just turn to the screen <laughs> right, exactly. and show that. Uh, Stretch Cunningham was the friend. You wouldn't think that Stretch Cunningham could be Jewish. And we never considered him to be Jewish, truth to tell, until we wanted him to die as a Jew. <laughs> <laughs> So that, our, so that we could do that episode. Archie and Edith go to the funeral. They, they, he hasn't even been asked to speak. He's asked to speak when he shows up. And uh, he doesn't know why they're giving him this little beanie, as the guy in the other show said. Without a, without a propeller, right. And, uh, you know, it, um, I think of uh, everything I went through with, uh, to do this show in the elevator where I wanted to see the baby born on Archie's face and uh, I, I could see that a thousand times and I, I'll always react the same way and the same thing with that when he gets up to talk about his buddy Stretch Cunningham uh, he tries to be as Jewish as he can and, uh, I mean, he, he, he uses a couple, he, he clobbers a couple of Yiddish words. Um, but it's one of those moments where, you know, I wrote Archie Bunker, the very first uh, episode, and I had an Archie Bunker on paper. But I never had the Archie Bunker that Carol O'Connor, because I never had Carol O'Connor or any specific actor in mind. So the miracle I'm reminded of, and it fits your question, I'm reminded of is when an actor 
puts the words on as if it was a uniform or, you know, he was his skin. He gets into his skin and he's, and that's what would happen through season after season when we would fight over a script and there were times when he was, he was not going to show up and you know, all kinds of things were, and then either the show was off the air or he slipped into the character and what he did was slip into the character and then nobody could write the archaisms like he could speak them naturally it would just come out of him uh, I mean it's when I'm reminded of the miracle of that you know it, I can only speak of it that way before we let you go, one, and that's a beautiful remembrance of Carol O'Connor, but somebody who doesn't get time on the screen about that show um, is Jean Stapleton. And I'm wondering if you could just leave us with a memory uh, of her. Somebody asked me shortly after the show hadn't been on that long, uh, what's Jean Stapleton like? And I'll never forget the first thing I said about her was, she's always where she is. And it, I don't know whether it was a, that minute or an hour later or, or, or weeks later or whatever, but I thought about how remarkable that was because that's who she was. She was, if she stopped to talk to you, she was 100% with you. We asked ourselves, well, let me tell you this little anecdote. When I, I Marion Doherty was the casting woman. There's a book about her that came out a few years ago. She was a glorious woman in New York. And she brought Jean Stapleton in to meet me. Uh, and she read, and I, I just loved her. I said to her, you know, I saw something happen to my, with my Aunt Fanny once when I was alone in the kitchen early in the morning and she came into the kitchen and she was wearing a robe and a nightgown and she opened a refrigerator and she bent down to get a, a, uh, something out of the lower and a, and a breast fell out and she tucked it back in as quickly as that. Whoop, whoop. I said, I'm thinking about doing that. And she, and she smiled and so forth. And she was going to Pennsylvania Station to take the train to uh, Pennsylvania where they had a summer theater, she and her husband. She called me from Penn Station before she got on the train. She said, Mr. Lear, you know, if you find you have to do that, I don't know if I can guarantee I could do that. I said, I promise you I don't have to do that. <laughs> you're, you're Edith. Uh, we asked ourselves, uh, it, when, when any question came up, what would Jesus do? That's the way we wrote Edith. When, wow. when, uh, when Archie gave mouth-to-mouth uh, -mouth resuscitation, to a woman in the back of his cab. Again, he was in the cab. And uh, the woman came to the door to thank the guy who saved her life. And Edith opens the door and learns that he was transgender. Right. It was really a guy. It had been born a guy. And the Archie comes down the stairs and finds out. What would Jesus do? She loved him. He couldn't understand he, he, he couldn't he couldn't live with the thought when Edith I wanted to do a, an episode in which Edith lost her faith and the only thing I could think of or we could think of by the way the we is so important here it's a giant collaboration you know nobody does anything in this business alone it's a lot of people we wanted to see what would happen to her when she lost her faith and the way we decided she would lose it was to have this uh, guy who, came, who lived, worked here in San Francisco this is where I found him uh, oh, 
the name he worked under is right in the tip of my head. And uh, anyway, we had him in, in the story. He was killed for being who he was. A God that could see that happen couldn't be. And so she lost her faith. Then it took us weeks to find out. We, we, we couldn't leave her without her faith. She had to regain it. How would she regain it became a big problem. Had people from the philosophy department. You, you, you. Now that's funny. <laughs> that is funny. <laughs> that was better than a hook. <laughs> We want you to complete the thought, though. <laughs> so we had somebody come in from UCLA and USC, from the philosophy department, sitting around, how does she regain her faith? And somehow nobody had asked until someone asked, when Edith lost her faith, what happened to Archie? And we had it. If Edith went to pieces, if she lost her faith, if she didn't retain her strength, Archie fell apart. And that's, you can check on that, you know, if, if I had to pick two episodes of all the shows or something, it could well be those two episodes. Well, it just shows you what um, a lifetime's worth of insights and passion and especially humor, but also simply truth uh, have come out of your and your collaborators' work, collaborators on screen, collaborators behind the screen. Um, but I think without the engine of you, uh, we would be in a, a, a much poorer place. So for everything that you've done, for us as Americans, as television viewers, and even, we can say, as Jews, thank you, Norman Lear. <laughs> thank you. Thank you all very much.